This uh, is going to be about Carol Gilligan and the reading that we have, uh, which is an excerpt from Gilligan's uh, In a Different Voice, uh, published in 1970. So it's old, but certainly not as old as some of the other stuff we've read. Um, there's a, I guess I'll start with a, there's in, in Buddhism, there's this parable of the three blind men and the elephant. And I don't remember the details of it, but something to the extent of they've got this elephant, right? And they bring in these three blind men to, uh, you know, figure out what the elephant is. Well, they figure it out by feel, right? And one of them is feeling the kind of trunk and the ears. And he says one thing of, you know, what the animal looks like. Uh, another one is feeling the big hooves, you know, um, and the feet and the coarse skin and says, well, this is what the thing is actually. And then another one is feeling the body or whatever. You get it, right? Um, so the three people have fundamentally different understandings of what this thing in front of them is, right? And they fight. I don't know how the story ends up, but right they're 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 really, you know, going at it, debating over who's right, right? Who's right about what this thing is? Well, they're all wrong, right? Because they all have a limited perspective on what that thing is, right? Um, and I, to some extent, that's why we read all of the philosophy that we read, because... You know, it's all limited in its perspective. There's no one right philosophy. Uh, we don't have to choose one, so we might as well make our perspective as rich and accurate as possible. And that's what this image here, I think, is another good example of why different perspectives matter and why really feminist philosophy was such a coup, I mean, in the 1960s. And to some extent, it still is because people don't want to... People, right, just like the, you know, the blind man feeling the trunk of the elephant, people think that their perspective is the right one um, and the wrong. Uh, so here you have, right, if you're standing at view point A and you look, you know, at these red, white, and blue blocks uh, through that uh, object, that star, your viewpoint is going to look one specific way, right, that you have. That's why, like, when you open one eye, shut one eye, open one eye, things kind of move, your, your finger moves. Um, where viewpoint B has a different perspective, right? That, that the, the, the object is uh, in line with the red box as opposed to in line with the blue box. Um, which, which perspective is the right one? Well, obviously neither, right? They're, they're describing a, something that uh, uh, you need to have both of these perspectives in order to understand really the bigger picture of things. Um, and that's what feminist philosophy provides us, that we have... Um, 2,500 years of philosophy um, that is largely from a perspective of, of men. Um, and, you know, depending on the region of the world, it can be more inclusive or less inclusive. Depending on um, uh, the historical time period and where it was produced, it can be more or less. Um, but if we're talking about Western philosophy, European, North American philosophy, um, it's really not until the 1960s and 70s that um, you get a new perspective on philosophy. And this is largely out of women being let into PhD programs, being let into philosophy programs, psychology programs, also people of color being let into these programs. I'll have more on this. I'll give a little lecture about how the kind of radical social movements of the 1960s uh, change the way people think about things, but also open doors to higher education to people who have fundamentally a different perspective, right? And it's not just that like, oh, anyone's perspective, right? It's all good kind of relativism. Um, but it is to say that um, uh, a limited perspective had uh, to that point been represented in uh, philosophy to, to limit ourselves to just philosophy. Let's just stick with that. Um, so 1960s and 70s is a second wave feminism, right? First wave feminism is like, Katie Stanton, right, Seneca Falls, all that kind of stuff you, you learn in A-Push. Um, so this is second wave feminism in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and as women enter into philosophy programs and start reading the philosophy and, and uh, having dialogue with classmates or professors, they realize that um, they're asking the wrong questions, right? Um, you can't just say like, oh, the social contract, it, it applies to everyone. It doesn't apply to everyone. Um, the social contract is about people in the public sphere. Rousseau, Hobbes, Locke, when they're talking about the social contract, they mean people out in public, right, making contracts. Well, women are not out in public. Women are relegated to the domestic sphere. So 
what, what do we do about that? How do we understand social contract theory as encompassing women? And right, this is philosophy. So we can't just say like, oh yeah, 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 they, they yeah, those guys count too, right? Next, right? That's not exactly what the discipline of philosophy is all about. Um, similarly, John Locke, famously one of the key Lockean notions is that we have property in our own person. We are in charge of our own bodies. Therefore, we make our own decisions. We have free will. We can come into, you know, negotiations or debate with another as equals. When Locke is writing, women don't have property in their own person, right? They are the property of their fathers, their husbands, um, etc. So what? How do we how do we think about what Locke is saying and apply it to women? And again, we can't just say like, yeah, 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 them too. Right. Again, that's not what philosophy does. So this is a really important addition because right, it's not to say that the masculine or male perspective is wrong. Right. Rather, the issue is, as I have here, right, that in its unquestioned primacy. So in the assumption that it is right, like the only perspective, it becomes universal. Right? So if you have a bunch of people who think the same, act the same, look the same, are the same, talking about something for years and years and years, generations and generations, that the, the conclusions that they draw are going to be seen as universal conclusions. When someone different enters the room and they say, hey, wait a minute, you're, you're actually just, you're at viewpoint A and I'm at viewpoint B and you're not telling the whole story, it really challenges right, the the um, those perspectives. Um, so this is why this is a very important intervention and why it's, I mean, people, I mean, again, like on the, in the internet or whatever, I guess it's more mainstream now, sadly. Um, but you know, people like, yeah, feminism, you know, uh, like this is, this was published in 1970, right? It's not, it shouldn't be so controversial. I mean, um, uh, uh, if we're really thinking, uh, if we're really thinking critically about this stuff, it's very important. Um, and Gilligan herself is not a philosopher; she's a psychologist, right? And she comes up with right. The title of this is from an essay uh, in a different voice, and we'll watch some video, some interviews with Carol Gilligan in class. And in one of them, she says very specifically, it's not that she wanted to say in a woman's voice. She wanted to say in a different voice, because while these things are, we'll call them masculine and feminine, right? Male and female perspectives. They're both, men and women have both, right? So um, the traditional understanding was as the Kohlberg experiment that she talks about suggests, men have one kind of perspective and it's about justice and about doing what's right, and it's about in being an individual, and women have this other perspective, but the other female perspective, right, about community and interpersonal relationships is somehow lesser than. Um, uh, and Gilligan push back, pushes back against that. So again, to, I don't want to belabor this point, but um, everything that we read when they talk about man, they mean man. Um, uh, and there are some exceptions. John Stuart Mill was kind of a feminist in his own right. Um, Engels wrote about marriage being a kind of form of oppression uh, in that women, you know, were pro basically property, right, were property of, of men. Uh, Plato's Republic has some stuff about female rulers. Um, but for the most part, um, uh, a lot of the philosophy that we look at looks at individual actions just, unjust, individuated perspectives as right or wrong, very black and white, very, you know, that's it. It's right or it's wrong, it's just or it's unjust. Um, and that, again, presupposes a certain perspective on things. Um, most philosophers, again, we can be as generous as we want, but most philosophers don't, you know, in, explicitly in their writing, don't either don't talk about women or marginalize women to some lesser position. Um, uh, Hegel says women are like plants, men are like animals, women are like plants. Um, for uh, Aristotle to Descartes, there's this idea of the mind being more important than the body um, and that men are more associated with right, the mind, women more associated with the body because of childbirth and menstrual cycles and things like that. Um, women also being more associated with emotions, men being associated with right, uh, thoughts and intelligence. 
Um, right, which is, you know, men have emotions, women think. So, like that, that kind of is out the, that, that argument kind of falls flat on its face pretty quickly. Um, there are exceptions, right? Buddhism, Marx has some stuff about equality of women, Native American philosophies. But for the most part, if we're talking Western philosophy, it's a very specific perspective. Um, okay, so let's talk very briefly here about the actual Gilligan. Um, so she is a psychologist. Uh, she's working, she's teaching at Harvard. She's, Kohl, she's one of Kohlberg's students, right? Um, uh, reads Kohlberg, um, teaches psychology. Um, and she begins to question, she, and in one of the interviews she says, you know, she never really thought about the fact that all of these participants in the studies were men. And when she starts to question that, all of these other questions start to come up of like, well, wait a minute, Let, let's look back at this and, and, and look at the, the research and see what conclusions we should be drawing. Um, so all male subjects in Kohlberg, and you'll learn if you're in AP Psych, you might learn about Kohlberg or Piaget at some point uh, this year or next year if you're a junior or yeah, you learned about it last year right, if you're a senior. Um, so she critiques this. How can you have how can you draw universal conclusions based on a very specific demographic of people, right? Um, and she critiques that, right? So she looks at Col Kohlberg's findings and finds that on the one hand, the women, when women are interviewed or when men uh, are, are interviewed and, right, show a certain stage of moral development, that stage of moral development is around stage three, um, Kohlberg has, I think, six or maybe nine stages of moral development. Um, and stage three is the one that's interpersonal, helping others, wanting to please others, um, being, seeing yourself as connected to others. Um, that's also the one that female participants are more likely to voice, right? So Kohlberg says, well, their moral development is kind of, you know, stalled out at level three, where if you want to hit the five and the six that is associated with men, um, you need to talk about individuality, your individual conceptions of justice, um, uh, and all of that stuff, right? She says this is a problem, right? Um, and we've done the reading. We can talk more in class. Um, but one of the main takeaways that she comes up with here is that categories of knowledge are human constructions. It's not a given, right? So the fact that, like, this was a way of categorizing knowledge that the highest form of knowledge, the highest form of moral development is this ind highly individuated um, uh, conception uh, and one that's associated with abstract, right, justice, universal justice, right and wrong, um, and saying, well, that's the best one, and not questioning, well, is it the best one or is it just the one that, right, these men have said, uh, as opposed to women saying something very different, such as, we feel more, right, when we make decisions, we have to make decisions being conscious of other people's feelings, other people's uh, emotions. This is, in some ways, Carol Gilligan is new to you, but this research is not. The very idea of emotional intelligence, which is something that is just like in the air that we breathe in the 21st century, this notion of emotional intelligence and understanding how your emotions affect your thinking, how your thinking affects your emotions. Um, that comes out of research like Carol Gilligan's. Um, not that like men are just kind of, you know, sterile, rational actors and there's no emotions at play at all, where women are all about the emotions and their emotions influence the way they think and that's not good. Um, that was the old school binary. Um, researchers like Gilligan have broken that down to the extent where we don't really question that anymore, right? That like, of course, your emotions play a role in your thinking, whether you're a man or a woman. So Carol Gilligan might be new to you, but the, the, the idea is hard. Um, so anyway, categories of knowledge are human constructions. I want to talk more about this in class, but a couple examples, um, Darwin's language. So people say, oh, you know, Darwin's language was hijacked by social Darwinists like Herbert Spencer, and they were applied to like, you know, justify, you know, the, the, the imperialism and capitalism and exploiting of, right, the, the developing world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you look at Darwin's language, it's not Herbert Spencer that, you know, applied Darwin's objective biological ideas to human populations. Darwin is writing in the 1850s, 60s in England, and his language is steeped in industrial capitalism. It's all about competition. 
um, about con about uh, contract, um, about so I mean even the well survival of the fittest isn't originally a Darwin Darwinian idea, right? That that people are in that uh, uh, entities are in competition biologically, right? That all of this stuff was Darwin was thinking about what he was seeing around him. Right? And it unconsciously affected his language. So you have an understanding of the biological world and the language that's applied to it is all about 19th century English political economy. Right? Categories of knowledge are human constructions. Uh, similarly, uh, the Himba people of Namibia. This is, a, this is something that I think uh, you will maybe do in AP Psych if you're in it. Uh, but you have these two different um, uh, color wheels here. I don't know if the color is off a little bit because of the recording. Um, but on the left, right, lots of shades of green. On the right, lots of shades of you know, blue-green and then one that stands out. Um, the Himba can't differentiate or, or take longer to differentiate the one that is different on the right where they can spot very quickly several different shades of green on the left, right? Because they have a different way of categorizing color, right? Greens and blues are more uh, together where we have green and blue separate. So for us in the West, right? We look at this color wheel on the right and we very go, our eyes automatically go to that one block in the upper left quadrant and we say that one's different. Um, and then we look at this circle on the other side and we say, uh, maybe, right? Himba person, just the opposite, right? They look at that color wheel on the left and they can point out which ones are different shades of green. They look at that color wheel on the right and they have a harder time, right? Looking at that because again, the language, right? Affects the way that they think. Categories of knowledge are human constructions. Um, the ancient Greeks, you will not find anywhere in ancient Greek writing anyone talking about blue. No blue skies, no blue oceans, no blue flowers. They don't have a word for blue, right? They have lots they describe. I mean, Homer talks about, you know, the like wine dark sea and all this kind of stuff, but it ain't blue. They don't have a notion of blue. Um, that's really weird because we do and we go, oh, that's a blue sky, right? It's logical to us. Again, categories of knowledge are human constructions. So this is an abstract idea, but it points at two different modes of ethical being, right? The one of which is masculine, which is the one that was par for the course forever, um, historically conditioned and developed, um, feminine mode of being or ethical mode of being is historically marginalized, right? Um, that uh, um, caring about others, feeling as though you're in common with others is, is subordinate to right, the individual out in public. Um, again, public sphere, private sphere, right? Two different settings, uh, focus on individual rights, the masculine perspective. Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, um, uh, Hegel, Kant, you name it, individual rights. Locke, obviously the English political economists are the, the peak of this, right? Individual rights, your ambition checks my ambition, Adam Smith type stuff. Um, the feminine is very different, right? It's about responsibility to others. Um, how do you make choices knowing that you are in, in common with others? Um, what rules are just or fair? How do we best fulfill our responsibilities, right? What's fair? Good, bad, fair, unfair, just, unjust versus I've got certain responsibilities. I have to make decisions given those responsibilities. How do I do that? Um, as opposed to self-interest, um, uh, we have networks of interconnection. Um, we'll see more about this when uh, in, in Gilligan talking about her research um, and uh, researching women who are trying to make just decisions, good decisions, fair decisions, knowing that there's incompatible, you know, you know, the husband wants one thing, the father wants another, your kids need another. How do you make a decision given the fact that, right, how do you make the least bad decision as opposed to just what's just, what's fair? I am an individual, you know, there are no ties to others. Um, uh, so these two ways of thinking about ethics are very, very important. And again, that's why Gilligan does not call it in a uh, feminine or uh, woman's voice, but in another voice. 
um, in a different voice because you need to understand both. And in a lot of ways, you all in the 21st century, you do already, right? Uh, it's, this is not 1967. So this shouldn't be revolutionary. So even if you think it's revolutionary because you've never heard of it before, it is, you know, it is very much part of the standard discourse of um, emotional intelligence, um, uh, um, interconnected uh, um, interpersonal relationships and things like that. More on Gilligan in class.